Hello, and welcome to a special broadcast on strengthening your school district through positive social media, offered in partnership by Archive Social and Enspra. My name is Melissa Bram, and I'm the Associate Director of the National School Public Relations Association. I've spent more than 20 years in the field of public relations, including 12 years working with school systems across New York before joining ENSPRA to serve schools at the national level. Over the years, I've participated in many of the changing social media trends for our schools. I've seen how our sphere for engaging stakeholders has widened with more tools, while narrowing at the same time as our audiences have become more segmented in their interests. I've also seen how organized opposition groups, online threats, and special interests can wield a school district social presence or lack thereof, against it without the proper preparation. Today, I'm excited to hear what our panelists have to share on how positive social media can strengthen our districts and on how we can tackle challenges related to managing our social media records. You may have noticed that all attendees are on mute. We'll open up for live questions at the end of the program, and you'll be able to submit your questions through the Q&A function in your GoToWebinar control panel. After the program, you'll also have access to resources such as slides for this presentation. Up first on today's agenda is a discussion about strengthening your district through positive social media with our first panelist, Madeline Sattler. She'll be followed by a discussion on requirements and policies related to social media records retention with Brian Carter. At the end, we'll have time for a live Q&A with our panelists. Madeline Sadler got her start in journalism with a career in broadcast news. The news industry is very in tune with identifying emerging trends for engaging their audiences. And Madeline has been able to leverage that background and experience in her work as a communications specialist with Cascade School District Number 5 in Oregon. Thank you for joining us today, Madeline. I'll turn it over to you. All right. I am waiting. I got to share my screen and get this all started for you. So um, I'm really excited to talk to you guys today about social media, uh, the benefits of social media, and some effective strategies to create some positive social media regarding your schools and your school district. Uh, just a quick background on me. I, uh, like Melissa said, got my start in journalism. And as a journalist, had to be in tune with social media. I had to use social media to create my own brand for myself, as well as the station, the TV station, which I worked for. So those skills and the storytelling skills really translated when I got my start with Cascade and I made the move to more of a public relations role. Cascade School District, we are a small district located in Turner, Oregon. We have three elementary schools, one junior high school, one high school, we have an alternative school, and an online academy as well. So we service uh, a little bit more than 2,500 students, and we have a staff of about 300 across our entire district. We have three different towns that actually feed into our schools. So the towns, um, the population of our, our district as a whole is about 6,000 people. So a small rural district uh, with three towns. We have Turner, Almsville, and Marion that all feed into our district. And it's really cool that our high school and our junior high school are really the focal point of these three very different communities. And so knowing that and knowing that about my district, I've really tried to make sure our social media really encompasses all three of those towns and really brings those communities together so that our school can be a sense of pride for those people. Um, our school district is growing. From just from last year to this year, we've seen an increase of 7%. More and more people are moving into our district because our schools are improving and we're sending out such a positive message and they wanna be a part of this community. Um, median housing pricing in the district has increased we take in transfers from other school districts and this year our transfer list is actually full so we are 
are pretty full in our schools and people want to be here. And I can attribute that to positive social media and really creating a camaraderie amongst our community. Social media is free. It costs nothing to create a Facebook page or an Instagram profile or Twitter account for your schools and your school districts. And it really gives you control over your story. You're the one that has the power of what you share. You're the one that gets to showcase all the wonderful things that are happening in your school district. So using social media is a really great tool and it's a free tool. One of the things I think social media can help with is watering down some negative things and, and maybe some of the not so great things that sometimes happen. Um, I'll give you an example. We had a student last year who threatened to bring a gun to school. And we use social media to keep our community informed, let them know we're aware of the threat, let them know we're working with local law enforcement. And then when the student was um, taken into custody, you know, let them know that we've you know addressed the threat that it's no longer an issue we will have law enforcement at school to make sure everyone's safe but we can assure you that we've taken all the precautions the necessary precautions and you never want something like that to happen but when it does if you have positive social media and you're posting positive things on social media on a regular basis that negative event is not at the top of your news feeds for very long so it's being proactive so the times when you have to be reactive it kind of softens that blow so that's another great thing about social media and i know in our district social media has really helped us create camaraderie amongst our community they feel a sense of pride and it's because of the positive things we're really pushing via our social media accounts um, some just general effective strategies with social media the biggest one i can tell you is including visuals. Um, visuals are more likely to lead to engagement. And when I say engagement, I mean people liking, commenting, and sharing your posts. So I'm gonna start with just Facebook. This is just Facebook, but um, on average, with Facebook's algorithm, a post will reach about 5% of your following. So if you have 100 people that like your school and you post something, it's gonna show up in five news feeds. But if those five people are engaging with the content, then it continues to show up in more and more people's news feeds. And what leads to a lot of engagement is visuals. So making sure to include visuals in everything you're doing is really effective. In general, nowadays, people are lazier. They want the information to come to them as opposed to seeking it out. So the more engagement you can generate, the more news feeds you get your information into, and the more people will be likely to see your content. So the photo I have in this slide is two silly kindergartners just giggling at lunch. And this is an example of what I call timeless photos. I have a stockpile of photos of cafeteria, recess, gym class, computer lab, general classroom shots. And they're photos that don't need to be posted at a particular time, but you can use at any time to make your announcements a little bit more interesting. And I'll show you an example. Um, this was just an announcement about, it was gonna be a long weekend for our students, post a picture of one of my little first graders smiling at lunch to let everyone know, hey, it's gonna be a long weekend. Something like this makes a boring announcement a lot more fun. and so having a stockpile of photos or images that you can use at any time really helps get your message across. People are gonna remember something. They're more likely to remember something that has a visual with it as opposed to just a piece of text information. The other thing that I use a lot in my district is video. And video is another visual. It leads to a lot of engagement, especially if you can use video to create more of an emotional response. So I know in my community, we have a lot of military families. We have a lot of veterans. So knowing that posting something on Veterans Day was going to lead to a lot of content interaction, um, knowing that was why I came up with this video idea. And I'm gonna just show you just a little bit um, of this video and play it for you. 
Um, so you can see, we did a thank you Veterans Day video. We used students K through 12 to say thank you to their family members and um, just show us unified as a district. So I'm gonna hit play and hopefully this works for you. Thank you for welcoming my grandparents for serving. Thank you, Dad, for your service. I love you. Bye. Thank you, Uncle Bob, for your service. Hi, Grandpa. I want to say thank you for your service for the military. I love you. Thank you. Thank you, Uncle Joel. Thank you, Dad. I really love you. Thank you. So I'm going to pause it there. Um, and so you kind of uh, get a sense of what um, that video was. And I hope I'm going back to the screen for you now. Maybe not. Um, back to the presentation. There we go. Um, can you guys see the slides again? I think we're good. Um, so knowing my community, knowing what is important to the people, um in my district um oh wait here we go we'll go back to the main screen right now um i think this is working uh hopefully um, you're working madeline okay sounds good thank you um so knowing what's important to um the people in our district knowing our audience knowing we had a lot of veterans in our community this video really resonated with them um it reached more than 6,300 news feeds, so it was popping up in people's Facebook, and it's been viewed more than 3,000 times. So knowing our audience, showing us unified as a district, uh, generating an emotional response, that's what something like this does, and that's why the video can be a really powerful tool when it comes to your social media. So um, I want to, kind of break down different strategies I do with my district-wide social media and then talk a little bit about some of the things I do at the elementary level versus the secondary school level. Um, I manage the social media accounts for our school district, which our district as a whole has a Facebook, a Twitter, and a YouTube channel. And then the five schools have, each has a Facebook, an Instagram, and a Twitter. Um, and then our high school also has its own YouTube channel as well. So there's some different strategies I use for the different levels of social media. As a district, my goal is to really create a sense of community and facilitate that sense of pride that people feel being a part of the Cascade community. Um, and I'm gonna give you an example. Turner is one of the towns we have in our district and they recently established this they called it the Turner Trail. It was a one and a half mile loop through town. And while Turner is just one of the three towns that make up our district, this trail was such a collaborative effort. Um, our high schoolers, manufacturing classes made the trail markers. Our fourth graders across the district researched nature information and local history to put on the trail markers. The football team was laying bark chips the junior hires were volunteering at the event and so the awareness just engaged our entire district even though the event was just in one town and we promoted this on a weekly basis leading up to the big unveiling they were hoping for 200 people they had more than 600 people show up on a saturday morning to walk this trail and those people were from all three towns in our district so they were excited um, and it really created this sense of camaraderie that people feel pride in our district. Another strategy I use district-wide is thanking donors and volunteers. 
the two photos in this slide, we had a local hairdresser come and give haircuts to some of the students who couldn't afford to get a haircut. And this does a couple things. It helps, again, build up the community. We're thanking community members. And I try and make a point to say specifically what their time or money went towards. We had a coffee shop that donated money and I could say, hey, this, thank you for the donation. Thank you for your generosity. We were able to clear 28 negative lunch account balances. So it shows that that service and that money is going directly towards our students. So I do this across all the pages, not just the district page, but across all of our school pages as well. It keeps people coming back. These donors are getting a little bit of publicity for what they're doing. It makes other people more likely to donate it and it shows collaboration. It gives people a sense of pride. It's again, an emotional response. They're proud to be a part of, communi of a community that gives back to its schools. Another idea that I've done across our district is a segment called Sit Down with the Superintendent. It's a little bit self-explanatory, our superintendent talking about a different issue each month to, you know, that relates to most of the schools or affects a lot of our students or parents. Mm -hmm. This does a couple of things. Um, it, one, gives the superintendent a face. It makes them a little bit more personable. It's also not waiting for something to happen. It's proactively creating our own content. And this one, which I can't, you know, I think is really important. The most important thing is it actually tends to lower the complaint level or friction level among our district if people feel like they have a relationship with the superintendent. It's a lot easier to criticize a faceless person, but if they say, hey, um, you know, I kind of feel like I know this guy, I, I, he's a real person, um, it makes it a lot harder to be critical of our superintendent. And if it's the superintendent saying something, it gives it a little bit more credibility. So that's one thing, um, just an idea if you're looking for ways to create content or things that you'd like to do in your district, sit down with a superintendent or you know a principal's message monthly where the principal talks about something is another idea. And another thing that you can do to increase your content engagement is sharing and interacting with your own content. So if I post something on the district page that pertains to multiple schools, I'll share it to different accounts. Or because I manage multiple pages, you know, if I post something on one of my elementary schools, I can share it to the district page. And that just gets those engagement numbers up and helps that information or whatever you're posting show up in more people's news feeds. So that's another idea if you're managing multiple school accounts. Um, at the elementary school level, I really love getting to manage some of the social media um, on the elementary level. It's really fun. Um, our kiddos have a good time. And it's really important. These are your younger parents, uh, especially kindergarten and first grade. It's their first time really sending a kid to school in a lot of cases. So they want to see what's going on. I have a lot of ideas for things you can do if you're managing elementary school. General school posts are really good, things that are happening in class. Uh, Motivation Monday is one that um, I'm going to show you in just a second, an example of using your school's motto. This is something I've done. We have an elementary school. Their motto is preparing, caring, and daring. So I grab a couple students, record a video. Hey, what does it mean to be preparing, caring, and daring? Or what are you doing today to be preparing, caring, and daring? It gets a lot of kids involved. Kids are cute. Sometimes they say hilarious things. It's funny. Parents like to see it. And it helps share your school's message. It helps, you know, create that story and that narrative for your school. So that's a good one. Holidays are another great opportunity. Valentine's Day, we did uh, tell me what you love about your school. Tell me what you love about your teacher. Uh, Thanksgiving is coming up next week. So you could go up to students and say, hey, what are you thankful for? Or even, you know, what is Thanksgiving? Why do we celebrate Thanksgiving? Especially with some of your younger kids, you might get a pretty funny response. And that leads to just more people liking, subscribing. It's positive. It's cute. It's really fun. Uh, kids say the darndest things. I'm going to show you an example of this in just a second. But just keep in mind, elementary learning tends to be colorful. Um, it's dynamic. Kids are moving. It's, it's not just sitting and listening to a lecture. 
So general things that are happening in your classroom, really fun to see, really fun to look at. Here's an example, our fifth graders making hot air balloons. It's colorful, it's visually pleasing, it's really, you know, an easy thing to snap a picture of, post it on social media. Look how cool our fifth graders are. Um, fish dissection, you know, funny faces. We have a lot of different reactions. So this is another one that, um, you know, you can use just again, that learning is really fun and exciting. Um, this is a video that I'm going to show you. We do it every week at one of the elementary schools I work for. It's called Motivation Monday, and it's students giving their classmates uh, pep talk and it's really cool the students you know you a teacher can say hey pay attention do your homework but there's something really powerful about that message coming from your kids so I'm going to uh, share this with you um, our motivation Monday video and play it for you um, we're getting the hang of this video thing but this is um, some of our first graders it's really cute we play it for our students and then we share it on social media. Parents like to see it. And it's a really cool idea. I saw another school did it, so that's why I decided to do it as well. I'm just gonna play a little bit of this for you. here but you kind of get an idea of what we do and um, what we're showing to our students uh, this is just another great way to proactively create content um, and I oh my goodness um, my go-to meeting has uh, has quit on me but hopefully um, I can get this um, back in as soon as possible. Um, we can still hear you. <laughs> you can still hear me. Okay, that's good. I'm gonna try and pull you guys up um, on my screen really quickly, but that's just another idea um, of what uh, we can do um, where you engage a lot of students. Um, and I'm pulling this up right now. Thank you guys for bearing with me. I'm gonna get back into this webinar and share my screen with you. Um, and, uh, are you, can you guys see my, my screen with me, my screen now? We see the slide with the video on it. Yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to pull that up. I'm going to present, uh, do you see me advancing to the next slide? You do not see that. Okay. So, uh, it doesn't look like I have the sharing. Um, so if you guys could possibly oh, share that. Something's with changing. Me. There it goes. Okay. Um, Erica is helping out. Okay, perfect. Um, all right, show my screen. I'm gonna present this again. And uh, thank you guys so much for, for bearing with me. Um, so, this is one other idea we do at the elementary level. It's called Kids Say the Darndest Things. Um, and this is just another idea if you have issues with maybe showing students' faces. Um, this is a visual, it's a graphic. You can, um, oops, you can, you know, kids say funny things. So it's funny, it's cute, and um, it's another way to create visual content. Um, so at the secondary level, 
we use social media and videos to apply for different grants. And this is really cool. It's been pretty powerful. We talk to students and have students explain the impact a grant will have on them. And that's a lot more powerful than you know a teacher saying it. Um, I've been having issues with video, so I'm not going to show you this video, but I'll explain briefly. We had, we were applying for a grant for our high school success funds. We had gotten the grants a year before and bought a new kiln and a pipe vendor for our manufacturing classes. The two classes collaborated and made this really beautiful bench. It was an Oregon Trail bench. The tiles were made in the um, in clay class and then the manufacturing class built the bench. So they talked about the impact making that bench had on them, how powerful it was to create something that will last forever. And when we submitted that to get the grant the following year, it was really powerful. We got another $25,000 for our students. So using videos to um, apply for grants is a great thing. And just in general, bragging about your programs. I know at my schools, we have really good um, CTE programs. We have a great manufacturing class. We have um, a cool chicken coop that our ag class has just built. So I try and do at least once a week talking about, hey, did you know that we have this awesome chicken coop now? So if you're interested in raising chickens and you don't have the facilities at home, that's okay. We can do it here at school. Things like that. If you have a really strong band or really awesome, you know, computer program or a school newspaper that's really great, those are things that you want to brag about. Parents pay attention to the schools their child is going to be in. Our high school and junior high school have a pretty big following on social media, and that's not just current parents, that's future parents. They want to know what's going to be available to their student when their student is at school in the next few years. So just keep that in mind and, and paying attention to what your, uh, you know, or parents are paying attention. So bragging about what you have. Um, again, I'm, I'm not going to play this video just because I don't want to freeze and, and uh, mess this up. But this is our sixth graders go to outdoor school every year. They spend a week at camp. So we put a video together talking about, you know, it's students talking about their experience and what outdoor school was like, what they learned. Um, so this is great. Parents wanted to see what their kids were up to. Future parents want to see what they're going to have in store when their child's in sixth grade. So this is another great idea, just keeping in mind what's going on at your school, what sort of events are happening, and bragging about those cool things. Some other key strategies that you can implement or just to keep in mind the biggest thing i would say especially if you're getting started is get others involved um, i manage the social media accounts for five schools as well as the district and it's a lot for one person so i have administrators at each school that are helping post photos and have really bought into the idea that we're creating a narrative and we're telling our story so getting administrators involved to help post things and share things on social media, um, you know, letting them know if you believe in your school and believe in our story, this is a really great way to share that and to share that passion. Um, what I do with my school, we have Google Drive for each school. So if teachers are in class and they're doing something cool, they can snap a quick photo. If they're on a field trip, hey, they snap a photo and upload it to the Google Drive. And we know that that's a photo that we can use for social media. One other thing with us at my secondary school, um, the high schoolers running social media account, um, I actually have students involved. So seniors, when they get to their senior year, they have that opportunity. If they've proven that they're responsible enough, they have the opportunity to actually work with me on managing a social media account. So I talk to the students about you know, what kind of things we post, how often we post, how to be proactive, how to run social media campaigns, how to respond to messages and comments. And it's something that they get to work towards during their time at high school. And, and then, you know, hopefully it's something, if they work hard enough, they get that um, 
benefit or privilege to run the social media account and learn how to do that their senior year. Another idea, I mean, I'm just giving you, I've got a lot of ideas of things I've done in social media campaigns I've run, but different giveaways or contests. We did one where our superintendent was, you know, he was going to hide Friday night at the football game. So every day of the week, put out a different clue as to where he was going to be hiding. And then the first five people who find him get a t-shirt. So it's proactively creating content. It's fun. It's, it, you know, it's exciting. Everyone wants a free shirt. That's another idea that you can do. But just in general, as you're getting started shaping your social media, I would just say to set some goals. When I started, our goals were three posts a week. All of those posts have a visual. And at least one of those posts was going to be, you know, creating our own content or being proactive. So you can use social media for announcements and letting people know what's going on or snow days or field trips or different events. But, you know, we made sure that one post a week for each of our social media accounts is going to be something proactively creating our own content. When I started, I also met with our administrative team and we came up with a couple different monthly ideas or, re or weekly ideas that we could do. Motivation Monday was one of them. Um, we do a news show at my junior high school where the students talk about the upcoming events of the month. And that's really fun. The kids get involved. They're excited to be a part of it. They get to produce it and write their own scripts. So there's plenty of ideas that you can come up with to create your own content. I looked at other schools in our area, social media accounts, what they did, some of their ideas, and trying to see how that could work within my district. Um, and so that's, that's really what it is, is, is trial and error. As long as you're trying to push positivity and share your story, people are going to be excited to see what's happening in your school district. So there's a lot going on, and I know all of your schools are, are really special places, and so this is a great way to share that story and to, you know, brag about the amazing things that are happening in each and every one of your schools. So I hope I gave you guys some ideas of things that you could do in your school district or just ways to make your social media even more effective. And I know there'll be time for questions at the end. And thanks for bearing with me with the technology, but I hope I could answer some of your questions now. And um, I look forward to answering your questions when we get to the end of this presentation as well. Thank you, Madeline. That was great. Your your insights on, you know, being proactive for the times when you have to be reactive. Those were great. And I, I we have quite a lot of questions coming in, but we're going to be getting to those at the end. Um, and for now, I'd like to go ahead and uh, introduce Brian Carter, who is going to be helping us dive into the latest updates on requirements and policies related to social media records retention. Uh, Brian has spent seven years in the compliance field and as a vice president for Archive Social. Uh, he represents a company that is now the number one provider for social media archiving in government. So welcome, Brian. I know. I speak for uh, our entire company when I say thank you to you personally, but also to Madeline, but more importantly to uh, ENSPRA as a whole uh, for being part of this uh, webinar. Archive Social uh, has enjoyed a growing relationship with ENSPRA over the past few years. It's very clear to us the value you bring uh, to those professionals involved with school communication. So my guess is the vast majority of those of you on today's webinar uh, joined looking to gain some fresh perspective on how to strengthen your district through the great examples and insights Madeline just shared with us. But I'm also guessing very few of you joined today considering public record laws and the impact of those laws may have on your social media strategies. That's my role here today to give you some uh, perspective to consider as you think through your whole social media strategy for your district or perhaps just for your school. Now, Archive Social has spent a considerable amount of time helping to inform uh, education professionals such as yourself on the reality that school districts, just like a city or a county public agency, are subject to Freedom of Information Act laws and regulations. And these same record laws have increasingly called out social media as being a public record. Now, my suspicion is many of you have never had a records request that has explicitly called out social media, but the nationwide trends are suggesting those numbers are increasing. So it's not a question of if, it's rather a question of when you'll get a request. 
So today I'm gonna to share a couple examples of this occurring, but just as social media has become a growing and essential part of your district's communication strategy, the likelihood you'll have to produce a record related to social media is likewise increasing. So my role here today is just to unpack that a little further, help you navigate your way around making some informed decisions about the steps you need to take uh, in order to meet associated record keeping requirements. My, here, my job here is not to bring fear, don't get me wrong, uh, it's really about helping you optimize your reach and the impact of your social media, but do so in a way that helps you uh, protect your district and your staff from unintended uh, legal consequences. So we wanna help you empower and protect open dialogue uh, within your community. So why don't we go ahead and dive in. Now, social media has some challenges related to record retention that deserve some highlighting. Uh, these are the challenges that I would say are unique to social media as opposed to maybe more traditional means and forms of communication. So challenge number one has to do with the dynamic nature of social media itself. Now, of course, one of the benefits of social media is that they are real time and they are dynamic. Your admins post information or content, end users interact with that content, they like it, they share it, they post comments or questions in response, and you carry on a dialogue with them. Throughout these interactions, you're adding, you're editing, and you're deleting comments, all with the intention of having an open dialogue and authentic interaction. Therein lies the challenge. You are responsible for not just the posts you make, but also any user-generated uh, content left on those platforms. I'm gonna show you this with some uh, illustrative examples actually happening across the US momentarily, but if you don't retain content that was edited or deleted, you are putting yourself and your district in a potentially precarious position should a public records request arise. Additionally, that deleted content could be lost forever. And the social networks themselves actually have no obligation to retain your content, let alone help you find it. Uh, we're gonna share with you an excerpt from Facebook's own published policies in regards to this, but I wanna be fair to the social networks. They're not evil. Their purpose is helping people and organizations effectively communicate and share. It's just their focus is not in retention, archiving, and retrieval of content. And that's where we step in. Now, all public entities have these challenges, not just school districts, but a somewhat unique challenge for school districts is you have to centralize your social media oversight. Enforcing social media policy and retaining records is difficult. Your social media accounts are distributed from the individual schools, to clubs, to teacher pages, but all these pages are subject to the same public record guidance as your district or your, uh, or your county. So let me take a deeper dive into the first bullet around social media being real time and dynamic. So when does a social media uh, post actually become a public record? Here are two examples for you. The truth is public records are defined at the moment they are created. Now the top example is showing you when social media is not a public record. You draft a version of a tweet, you send it around for review and comment, and you ultimately decide not to post or send out that tweet. Even though that uh, was created internally, it was never sent across your social network, so that is not a public record. However, let's say before you circulated that tweet for review, you posted it. You get a few comments internally that said maybe that wasn't the best idea, so you delayed it. Either it contained incorrect information or just wasn't aligned uh, with your strategies. At that point, it became a public record even though you subsequently deleted. Now, one thing you might be thinking as I share these challenges with you is how likely do you think it is that a social media uh, post might actually be lost? And I think the answer might surprise you. As the largest provider of social media archiving solutions, we're in a unique position that we can look across all 2,300 plus of our clients' social media archives and do some fact-based analysis. Back in May of this year, we took a random sample of 500 public agencies and school districts, and we looked across all the social media posts they made in 2018. It was over 10 million social media posts. Quick math, that's over 20,000 posts per agency or school district for the year. But in May, when we look back, more than three quarters of a million of those posts are now deleted. 
that comes out to about 1500 per agency or district or 126 a month. Making that math even simpler for you, that's one out of every 15 records that was published subsequently became deleted. So if you think about your typical Twitter feed or maybe looking at your Facebook posts, you probably see more than 15 posts at your screen at any point in time. What our record analysis showed is one out of those 15 is likely going to be gone in less than 12 months. So I talked a little bit about uh, your responsibility for maintaining comments, whether they're deleted or not, and how frequently deletion occurs. So let's talk about um, this actually happening in the news and unfortunately in the court system. Eau Claire, Wisconsin, a former student posted a Facebook comment on the district's page critical of a retired principal who is now working part-time as a crossing guard. The nature of their comments are really irrelevant to the story, but the district decided to delete the comment and block the woman from further commentary. The woman subsequently filed a public's record request to gain access to the deleted comments, and the district was un, uh, unable to produce the deleted comments. The woman has now subsequently filed a lawsuit it is pending litigation right now, but districts that are unable to produce social media accounts can face legal challenges, especially in situations where deleted or edited content is involved. Now I'm realizing this may feel like an extreme uh, anecdotal example, and you might be wondering how can social media content be deleted or lost? I mean, after all, all of you on this uh, webinar are communication professionals. You probably have knowledgeable admins. Maybe you even have a policy against deletion of comments, but this deletion can happen outside your own influence and control. So there's a few ways this can happen. One, a community member might decide to delete their own comment to a post you've made. That's not something you have control over. That member decided to delete their comment. Or they delete their own comment, which also deletes all of the replies underneath that comment. Screenshot to your left here between Timothy McFarlane and Gwen Sock are a great example of that. If Timothy decided to delete his first comment, shocked that they're teaching yoga in public schools, all those subsequent comments beneath it are also deleted, including any uh, comments the district may have made in response. Or Timothy may get so fed up with social media, he quits the network altogether. That erases all his comments and posts that have ever been um, posted across that network. So that's a way things that are completely out of your control, but can impact your responsibility for maintaining uh, records. So as you think through the impact of social media record retention, you might be thinking, well, isn't that the network's responsibility to help me make sure that I'm staying compliant? And the reality is you can't rely on the networks. Again, the network's primary responsibility is to cater to the in billions of individuals who want to use their platforms for communication. Their expertise is not in the archiving or retrieval of content. And in fact, posting for you here, Facebook's own guidelines uh, around uh, preserving records. And they state if they do not receive a valid preservation request before a comment has been deleted, uh, there's nothing they can do about it. So you can't rely on the networks. Let me walk you through uh, a few other examples. Madeline cited uh, some safety issues uh, at her school. As school safety issues become increasingly common and social media continues to serve as a communications channel, you need to be able to produce social media records for use in legal situations and investigations. Stafford County, uh, County Public Schools is in Virginia. They are an archive social client. A student posted a bomb threat on their Facebook page. The principal was alerted right away by our platform. And of course, members of the school community also saw the threat and notified the school through private Facebook messages. The school was able to export those records from archive social and share them with law enforcement as part of the investigation into the threat. I'll share with you another example, this time out of the Pacific Northwest in Oregon, Beaverton School District. You know, schools often encounter sensitive situations 
And one student's experience can trigger a records request or a legal challenge related to how the school is actually using social media. Now Beaverton put together a school resource officer program to ensure there was an officer on site at schools. Now due to their child's experience with a particular officer, a parent issued a records uh, request for all information related to the program, including all the information that had been posted on social media. Now the communications director at Beaverton School District was able to respond quickly by doing a search within Archive Social to produce those records and satisfy that records request. One final example for you involves Evergreen School District uh, in the state of Washington. The one thing I want to make sure is that districts shouldn't feel in, uh, they should feel empowered to moderate content on their pages. You want to empower open dialogue, but you also want to protect that open dialogue which means you have to retain your social media records in compliance with state laws. Now, this particular story, Evergreen School District was in the middle of a teacher strike. The district produced a video explaining their position on the strike. They posted the video on Facebook. And as you could predict, the comments related to the video became highly charged and maybe a tad controversial. After the strike was settled, the district wanted to wipe the slate clean they wanted to remove all uh, strike-related content and commentary from their social media accounts, and they just wanted to move forward uh, as a community together. Totally understandable why they wanted to do that, but at the same time, uh, they had to retain all that content that had been created to ensure they were in compliance with their state public record laws. And because they have an archive with us, they were able to make those changes and know that they were in full compliance with that. Now, I gave you three examples, Virginia, Washington, Oregon. That's just three of our lovely 50 states. So if you want to learn more about your specific state laws, we've actually pulled together a state-by-state -state resource guide for you. There's a bit.ly URL uh, on your screen right now. If you copy and go there and click on your appropriate state, there's some resources available for you. Or simply go to our website, archivesocial.com. We have lots of public records laws and uh, examples of case studies uh, that can help inform sort of how you move forward with your uh, social media. So in summary today, a couple takeaways I want to make sure you have. Social media is a must for your district. Uh, its use is only growing. You know it's an effective communication tool. But what's also growing is records requests that include social media content. So it's a must for your district, and you're going to receive a request for social media content. Take action now before it's a problem. It's gonna pay off for your district and community. I think I speak for all of us when you say you don't wanna be in that position where you say, if only I had been archiving this. Now, I covered a ton of ground today. I shared a bunch of information. It's likely you have questions that we may not be able to get to during the Q&A that result to your unique district needs or maybe your state. So for those of you who have more in-depth questions, we're going to launch an optional poll. I encourage you to use that poll because a member of our team will reach out and share relevant and specific information with you uh, and answer questions for you, whether it's to learn about what's going on in your state, uh, public records requirements, uh, which districts near you might be archiving social media, give you some people to talk to uh, and hear about some legal situations near you. So we're gonna leave that poll up there for a little while, uh, just to give you a chance to uh, respond to that. Um, I'm also gonna add that uh, any information that I may have gone over quickly for you, uh, it's all covered on our website as well, but we're happy to share you uh, specific information in response to this poll. So with that, uh, I'm gonna give you a second to finish this up and I'm gonna turn things back over to Melissa for our Q&A portion. Thank you, Brian. That was that was great, helpful information for our, our school systems. And I know we have had quite a lot of questions coming in throughout the presentation. And um, just a quick one for you, Brian, and then I, I have a whole bunch for Madeline. Um, someone asked about whether those draft tweets would still be considered public records if circulated over email because school emails are considered public records. I assume in your example you were speaking just to whether or not it's a public record specific to social media, um, is yeah. that the case? 
uh, kudos to the person who posed that question. If they're circulated over school email, absolutely, that is a public record as well. The email is the public record. The tweet itself is not. It's a great Thank question. You. Thank you for the clarification. All right. Um, so, Madeline, um, we had some questions about um, social media policies. You had talked about working with your administrators um, to have them, you know, participate in posting or providing content. Um, a couple questions about how you encourage your administrators, um, like your principals, to get social, and um, also about, you know, if you have social media policies for employees who are going to be posting, whether it's on your pages or, you know, out on their own time. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think when I first started, people were a little bit skeptical as to the benefits of social media. So. What I did was I, I met with all our administrators and told them exactly what I was planning on doing, what the, you know, why it was going to be a good thing. But what I really had to do was get in the classrooms, take some pictures, take some videos and share it to social media and really show that people are interacting with this. People are really excited. They're proud to be a part of your school or your school district. So that's kind of how I started getting our principals on board. And as parents were saying, hey, you know, I saw that really cool video you put on Instagram. That was my kid. I'm really excited. The principals started buying into it. So it was a lot of, you know, convincing them by, you know, doing it and showing them the result. We have a social media policy at our district. Our staff members aren't uh, allowed to post photos of students without the consent of the parents or, you know, if, it's, if the student's 18, the consent of the student. So we have, you know, at the beginning of the year, the parents sign the media, our media release form to allow us to use their photo on the district website and our district social media pages. So that kind of gets around it where teachers are really excited to show what they're doing by having a Google Drive where they can just drop photos in and knowing that those, those photos are going to be used for social media helps get them around that where they won't post it on their own pages, but we can definitely use it and they're still sharing what they want to share in regards to what's happening in their classrooms or they're still getting to share something that they're really excited about or they're really passionate about as well. We did have a question about the um, posting, having teachers post pictures to a Google Drive folder, wondering um, how you as a communications person find out what less interactivity is going on in the photo. Do they provide information on the photo that they've uploaded? Yeah, so they'll send me a quick email. Hey, just so you know, I put this in the Google Drive or, hey, here are a couple of photos today. We were dissecting fish or we were making spaghetti and marshmallow bridges in science class. So especially if it's something, a project they're really excited about, our teachers are very willing to share exactly what's happening. And then our administrative assistants at each school also keep me updated on what's really happening at each of our schools. So they're in tune with exactly what's happening in their building so that helps keep me aware and um, so if someone posts a picture of just what's happening in class most of the time the secretary at that school has already let me know that something like that is actually is happening that day that's great now some um, folks were interested in um, you had mentioned your sit down with the superintendent segment and you shared a lot of videos and you know, they look like, you know, nice polished put together videos, but they're wondering the sit down with superintendent um, segment, is that, which social media channels is that posted on? Is it live or is it pre-recorded? So that's pre-recorded. We put it on our YouTube channel and then I share it to Facebook and Twitter. And then we also put it on our website as well. And some of the, um, we had a couple questions in relation to the negativity that we see on social media sometimes. And, um, you know, it was interesting with what Brian shared, you know, some school systems impulse might be to delete or hide those, you know, negative um, posts, particularly if they, you know, violate a, a school system's social media policy. But I'm curious if you can speak to a little bit about um, 
you know, whether you saw any negativity in response to the post about the, the gun situation and how you handled any, you know, misinformation shared in comments on your social media posts. So we have a, a social media policy where in terms, you know, it's, it's apparent, it's on our Facebook pages as to the comments that we hide. And those are comments that have profanity or comments that, um, you know, share personal information about a student or a staff member, anything that is going to um, be offensive, those types of things are comments that, negative comments that we do um, tend to hide. Um, in the situation, in our safety, big safety issue that we had last year, you know, people, the response wasn't negative per se it was more so just a concern for their children and um, people were relatively happy with the way we handled things and keeping them up to date as often as possible you know we when I put out because the threat was made on social media so people were messaging our page and letting them know letting us know about the threat from the beginning and you know just responding hey we're, we're well aware of this so what I tried to do was make sure we put out something every hour to keep people informed and so people were happy with the way we were not necessarily happy but they were glad that we tried to keep them up to date as often as possible negative comments happen and that's just part of it but if you're pushing out positivity and positive things and just really bragging about the great things that are happening in your school it does help water down some of the negativity a lot of times people tend to be self-policing, if that makes sense. So they might say something that's not super nice, but other people are going to say, actually, that's really cool, or we're happy that they kept us informed, even if um, someone is posting something negative. So yeah, the negative things happen, but if you're sharing positivity as much as possible, it really helps water down the negativity. It helps just not eliminated, but make it so it's not as apparent on your social media pages. And we had a, a few questions. Um, you know, uh, school PR can be a one person in a school system, or it can be a you know 15 person department. A uh, few people were wondering how you, um, how many people are in your communication staff, and how you uh, manage all of the different the different social accounts. Um, how you kind of divvy up that work a little bit. So I am a communication staff of one, or communication department of one, so it's a lot of responsibility on my plate. Um, I do have students that are helping with the high school page. Um, we have, I have a, a TA who helps um, make sure that, uh, you know, things are getting posted. One thing that I tend to do with social media, um, you know, at the beginning of the week, if I know there's different announcements or different things I want to push that week, on Monday, I'll sit down, I'll schedule all the Facebook posts that I know I want to have and, and the times I want to have them. So that gets that out of the way so that I can really be working on the taking pictures or creating a Facebook post about the things that are going on that week or, you know, the assemblies or the field trips or just the learning that's happening. And so I don't have to worry about, oh, you know, I got to post about the blood drive that's coming up where I have to share about the football tailgate. All of that's taken care of because I sit down and, and dedicate a little bit of time to that on Monday um, to make sure that everyone's informed that week. Um, working with our administrators and our, the different people that help post on social media. When I set the goals, hey, we're going to make sure we're posting on a daily basis. They you really bought into that so i don't have to manage them too much they understand that photos of what's happening in class things that are just general going on in the school that's still interesting so it's less to manage now that they're aware of what exactly um i'm looking for and that message was made clear to them at the very beginning when i started here now I have a, a we're, we're getting close to the end of our time here, but Brian, I have a few questions for you. Um, we have some questions about, you know, if your district has a lot of teachers using social media to share what they're doing in class, are their posts to their, you know, personal social media accounts also subject to a Freedom of Information Act 
request you know for public records made to the school system so i just want to make sure i'm unpacking the question correctly if it's, <laughs> if it's their personal facebook page mm -hmm. if they are talking about the business of the school on their personal page they could be subject to freedom of information act question absolutely and would that um, request if it was sent to the district, the district would then have to pursue that with the teacher? Correct. Okay, okay. We had um, another question about, um, you know, if posts, you know, let's say a post was deleted, maybe it just had a typo or something. Um, is a screenshot of the post sufficient for documentation? Or, and if it was just a typo, does it even need to be documented? Yeah, and I hate to be the bearer of bad news. If you put it out there with a typo and then deleted it and reposted it, even the delete the typo is considered, that post is considered a public record because you reflect back, public record is defined at the moment it was created. So you also have to weigh the balance of what's the likelihood of that being called in, but the reality is that's a public record. So you wanna make sure you're keeping a copy of it. And to answer your question about uh, screenshotting, uh, it's very common. We hear that a lot that people ref, uh, decide to screenshot. A couple, um, it's better than doing nothing, but you will not be fully compliant. Uh, not to get too technical, but it won't have the metadata, which validates the authenticity that that was in fact the official record, um, and also the accuracy of that uh, record. So it's common that we hear that. A few other things you want to think through about the screenshotting approach is um, where is it being kept. Is it keyword searchable? Could I find it in a stack as quick as possible? Or am I spending a lot of time versus typing in a keyword and surfacing up a record? So two things to think about. One is the legal aspect of it being uh, not digitally signed and authentic. The other side is just the human element of efficiency of collating, filing, and finding. I think I'm going to ask one last question here before we wrap up. Um, this might be a need to unpack one too, but the um, when school systems have a Facebook page, typically they're um, created or tied to an individual person. So, you know, Madeline might create a Facebook page for the school system, but Madeline's original name is tied to it. If, um, you know, if there are comments, things that need to be archived, would the individual who set it up for the district ever be liable in that situation, or would it always be the district because it's the district's page? It all depends on the state that that district resides in. The law does vary from state to state. In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. All the more reason to be knowledgeable of state record keeping laws. Unfortunately, there's not a federal mandate on how that happens. It's a state by state uh, decision. And they are ever changing. I'll give you a quick example. Texas, in uh, beginning of September, released a Senate bill which cl uh, clarified um, some of their information, including uh, naming superintendents as public information officers. So anybody uh, in the state of Texas, you might want to familiarize yourself with Senate Bill 944. And it also laid out some very specific uh, regulations and laws around using personal devices uh, for uh, work communication um, and what you need to do should you become an ex-employee of the district, but yet you were using a personal device. So it does vary state by state and the state regulations do periodically change. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, our, our webinar is coming to a close. So I really want to thank our panelists, Madeline and Brian, for speaking with us today. You gave us a lot of great information and things to think about as we're doing the work of school systems. I want to also thank Archive Social for partnering with ENSPRA on this very informative webinar. And of course, I want to extend a great thank you to all those who tuned in today to continue growing themselves as school PR professionals. So thank you all and have a great rest of your day.